When faced with the death of a loved one or someone close to us, we find ourselves being more reflective about life. We ask questions about the significance of life, the measure of life, and the significance of death. We bring into sharp focus our perspective of life and death and everything in between those two events. We bring into sharp focus our expectations of life for ourselves and for our loved ones. We face our mortality as we bear witness to the fact that someone can live however short or long a life, but then um, an event will occur, death, and they pass on to another realm. I found myself in this reflective uh, mood two years ago when my mother-in-law passed away on January 5th and then two weeks ago when my father-in-law passed away on December 24th. I recall that when my mother-in-law passed away, there were many questions about life and death that came up. There was outpouring of grief, as well as the raising up of questions surrounding her life and her passing. My mother-in-law had lived a very active life. From an early age, from her teens, she started asking questions about God, about life, and so on. She did a lot of reading. She read about other cultures. She was very interested in learning. She chose to go to university in her late teens at a time when it wasn't the norm for people, especially females, to go to university, even in um, the West. Then when she was in her early 20s, she took the very unusual step of choosing to become a Muslim. Then she moved to Nigeria, she started working here, she got married, she raised children, she worked with others, including her husband, my late father-in-law, may Allah have mercy on his soul, and they raised children and raised organizations as well. They set up organizations, they set up schools, they remained very active in the community, they remained very active at the international level as well. My late mother-in-law was a strong advocate for the advancement and development of girls and women, and she was also very active in education, just like my late father-in-law. My late father-in-law was involved in law as well. He was at one time a Sharia court judge. For my late mother-in-law, her life was so vibrant, so rich, that I think we mentally pictured her living to be a hundred years old. But as Allah would have it, she died when she had just um, reached her 79th year. That was a difficult time, I think, for the family because in the five or six years preceding her death, her health had declined gradually as a result of Alzheimer's disease and then later on Parkinson's disease. A couple of years before her death, she needed full-time care. Parkinson's disease had affected her mobility, so she couldn't move around. The fact that her health was in decline means that all of the things she had been used to doing for about maybe 50 years, traveling, reading, cooking, visiting people, all of those things just gradually came to a halt. And there was a period when we strongly hoped and prayed and believed that she would regain her full capacity. This didn't happen before she passed. So when she passed away, the questions that came up for us were questions such as such a rich life to then end without the richness of experience. I know there was a time I went to see her and after I came back from visiting her, I went back to the office, but I just sat in the car. I didn't go back into the office because I kept thinking she had given talks, presented papers, she had spoken to so many people uh, from different walks of life, she had traveled to talk about women and girls and education and the Muslim community, she had written books, and then she was you know, going through this period because of the Alzheimer's disease when she lost her memory of vocabulary and she couldn't always find the words she needed to express herself. And I found myself thinking, how did it come to this? Um, is this it? Is this how her life would end? And for me, it was those two things, the end of life and the measure of life. Those were the two questions I sat in my car that day trying to process, to think through. 
at a point I found myself then thinking that, you know, what would she say if she got a chance to find her words, to find the um, cognitive capacity to understand what was happening to her and to know that these were the thoughts that I was thinking and I know others were thinking as well, what would she say? From one of the talks she had given, she believed very much in the mercy of God. And for many people, they find it difficult to talk about the mercy of God when they see human suffering. And I wondered what would she say? When she first started having difficulty expressing herself verbally, I would write poems that I felt might express what she was thinking or feeling, and I would read them to her. And she loved those poems. That day, I, I wrote one not so much for her, but to help me process the questions that were in my head. And the processing of those questions is what I'd like to share now. When we talk about the measure of life, it's normal human nature that we would look at the beginning and we would look at the end and we would look at the high points and we would look at the low points and use these sort of as anchors to measure in life. If a person's final years have strife in them or pain or suffering or disease, we tend to sometimes then look at their lives through that prism. This is normal human nature because it's in our nature to look at the end of things. If you give me a dish of a really tasty meal, but in that final mouthful, I eat something that's going off, it's, it's sour, it's gone rancid. I'm going to spit it out. I'm probably going to keep talking about how terrible that last spoonful tasted. And I'm going to say it ruins the entire experience for me. That's what I'm likely to do. I'm likely at those moments when I'm thinking of that Ooh, rancid taste to diminish the joy or the enjoyment I had from all the other spoonfuls. When I think of my mother-in-law's life, I think of how from birth she had been learning and growing and developing, and how from her teen years she began to engage more with the world. And in her 20s, she took prides that were very bold, uh, going to um, coming to Nigeria from the United Kingdom, getting married to a Nigerian, raising children here, starting organizations, starting a school, traveling through West Africa. All of these were active and rich things. And if one calculates from her teen years or even from her 20s up until her 70s, when the symptoms of the disease started to show, we are talking about at least 50 years of activity and richness when we look at the years where she needed more and more care and couldn't do those things anymore, we are talking about five, maybe six years. And if we were to put these side by side, six out of 50 is a fraction of the time. If you take her entire life, 79 years, you remove the six, it's still six to 73 years. It's an even smaller slice of her life. And that day, sitting in my car, I said to myself that I think Hajia would say, do not look at my entire life through this narrow slice of time. Do not take all the years of richness and ability and squeeze them into these years of disability. I felt she would also say that these years are transient. And this is where I want to touch on the significance of death and the place of death in life. The perspective of some people is that when you die, you die. It's over, it's done. And we hear of this perspective even in the Quran when God says, some people are going to say, when we die, we'll be just dry bones, you know, you'll decompose, you'll you'll rot away, your body will rot away. And as for your soul, there's nothing there. But the Islamic perspective is that there is life, there is death, and there is life. And this life of this earth is described by God in the Quran as temporary, as a place of play and amusement. And he says it's a place where we dwell 
for a while. The Prophet ﷺ likened our existence on this earth to that of a traveler stopping under a tree to rest. Death becomes a passage, a corridor we go through, and then you come to the life after life, the hereafter. And that is what God describes as enduring lasting. He actually says in the verse of the Quran that Ma indakum yanfadu, whatever is with you will fade away, it will pass. Wa ma in the baqi, and what is with God will endure. So whatever it is we are connected to on this earth, when we go through that corridor of death, we leave it behind. We leave behind our wealth, we leave behind our loved ones, we leave behind our sickness, our strife, our pain, our worries. What is with God endures, whatever it is we have sent forth by way of our deeds, sincere good deeds, goodness to humanity, goodness to our community, sincerity to God, all those deeds we have pass them forward to God, they remain with him. And when we go through the corridor of death, we find these deeds waiting for us on the other side. If we haven't sent forth anything, then we find emptiness there. If we've sent forth something that God accepts, then we find such with him when we go through the corridor of death. So when I think, and even then when I thought of Hajj's life, I thought that yes, these years of disease, not one, but two debilitating, incurable diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, are difficult to deal with, even as an observer, especially when you know the quality of life the person had before the diseases came along. Yet, for all that pain, they are transient. They are a fraction, a slice of our entire life. And even if they come in the final years, those years are not the end. Death is not the end. She went through a corridor and she left all of that behind. We are the ones who remain, who remember what her life was like before the diseases came on, what her life was like when the disease came on. And we hurt because we remember. We hurt because we are still on this side where these things are still with us. However, through reflection, through contemplation, by remembering the Islamic perspective of life and death, we find equanimity, we find equilibrium, we find greater understanding. One more thing to also share is that when she passed, many people talked about the good things she'd done for them, to them, with them. There were many things that were mentioned that even my husband and my sister-in-law, her two children, said they didn't know about. And some things her sister would say, oh, she remembers that, but then, oh, okay, I didn't know that. A lot of her good came up, bubbled up. When my father-in-law passed two weeks ago, it was a similar experience where people would talk about this thing that he had done and that thing that he had done, and some of these good things come up. So hearing all that outpouring of the positives about the lives of these two um, amazing individuals. It makes us feel at peace with their passing away, in spite of the pain that came before the passing away of um, Hadia, as we call my mother-in-law. But it also makes us look at ourselves and say, what is the measure of our lives? Because my father-in-law had 90 years. That's a lot of time. It's a gift he was given. My mother-in-law had 79 years. It's still far many more years than many people enjoy. We then look at ourselves and say for all our 40, 45, 50, 55 years, what is the current measure of our lives? So on this occasion, as we reflect on the life and the death of Hadja Aisha B. Lemu and Ahmed Sheikh Lemu, we find it's important to ask ourselves what's the measure of their lives, what's the measure of our lives, and what is the significance of death as a passage, and what have we sent forth. We hope and we pray that our loved ones who have passed on will find good things on the other side. We also pray that every prayer we make for them will be accepted, that the good deeds we do on their behalf will be accepted, and that we will be able to make the best use 
of the years which we, which we have been gifted. Thank you for listening.